Genesis chapter 3, and it's really taken from this one question from verse 13. I, I think I should read a little bit of the surrounding verses, even though I know all of you are familiar, but it's important, and I'll, I'll mention these, these other things in the message. So let me start in verse 8. Of course, you know this is after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree that God commanded them that they shouldn't eat from. And it says that their eyes were opened. Yeah. Yeah. And they realized they were naked, and so they, they sewed fig leaves together to try to cover themselves. And then it says this, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He, that's God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, and this is, this is the text really, the question that we'll consider, what is this that you have done? Now to be fair, he'd already asked Adam pretty much the same question. So he wasn't, he wasn't just singling out the woman. It was both of them, the man, man, it was the man and his wife. They are man together. They both sinned. The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, you've probably had this same experience where you've been caught doing something wrong, something you weren't supposed to do. Maybe, maybe you remember these times when you were a child and you were disobeying your parents, and one of your, and your mom or your dad caught you in the act, red-handed, doing something you weren't supposed to do. And uh, parents love to ask questions like this. What are you doing? <laughs> what did you do? And they're not asking that question because they don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. They know full well what you did. There's another reason for that question. We're going to talk about that reason. Yeah, yeah. Now, what if, now you, can, you, can, you can remember probably when you were a kid, maybe, a, maybe when you were a small child, you know, you, you got caught by dad, especially if it was dad. You know, that's pretty scary. Dad's pretty scary. And dad caught you. But what if that was God himself? What if it were God himself saying to you, what did you do? What have you done? That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had eaten of that forbidden fruit. God, it seems, sought them out. They were trying to hide. But God sought them out. God confronted them. He surely had to know what they had done. He's not asking for information. There's another reason for the question. Amen. And God knew ahead of time that they would do it. We have to believe that if we believe in the sovereignty and the foreknowledge of God and the, and, and the omniscience of God. So here's the really the main question. I'm, my whole sermon is a question about a question. Why ask them that question? If God already knew. What's going on here? Is, is God didn't, did he, is that he didn't really know? And so he's asking for information? No, that's, I, don't, I don't think that's it at all. There's another reason. Yeah. And the whole rest of this message is going to be kind of circling around that, that question. What is this that you have done? Why would God ask a question like that when he knew what they had done? Now before I, before I answer that question, I'm going to ask another question. Why did God set up the circumstances that brought about the fall of mankind in the first place? I'm referring to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did God put that tree in the garden in the first place? I mean, so much, so much sorrow and misery could have been avoided if the possibility of evil had simply not been allowed. Why give evil a chance? Now, I think try, for me to try to chase down the answer to that question is a dangerous path. And here's why. It's because we're beginning to speculate. And that is not the reason for biblical revelation. The Bible is not concerned about the what if. The Bible is concerned about what is. The Bible gives us the truth about the way things really are. 
And this is what makes the Bible different from a work of philosophy. Philosophers are always asking questions, but not always arriving at answers. The Bible is not just raising questions for us to think about if we find the time. The Bible is causing us to face certain realities that are not very pleasant and that we might otherwise choose to avoid altogether if given the opportunity. The first reality the Bible is causing us to confront is that of God himself. That's the point of the entire creation account. In the beginning, God. God. It's all about God. Everything starts with God, so maybe we should start there too. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil has something to do with God and with our relationship to God. God had given the commandment concerning that tree. And so the knowledge of good or evil has something to do with God. I don't think there were poison apples on that tree. That tree was not off limits because it was inherently bad. Everything God created was called good by God himself. God doesn't make bad trees or bad fruit. Adam and Eve were immediately confronted with the option of good or evil, which was defined for them and made concrete by the commandment of God and nothing else. In a sense, God is saying, don't eat from that tree. Why not? Because I said so. That's why. And so God was not being unreasonable with them. God was giving them a choice. They could choose God or they could choose another path. I was, as I was meditating about this passage, I, I remember something that, that uh, my father used to say to Aaron and I when we were teenagers. Every once in a while, he'd say, you can do that if you want. You can do whatever you want, but you can't live here in my house and do that. And in a sense, God is saying, you can sin, but there's consequences. And we're going to deal with that too. The serpent appears then in Eden. We know from other scriptures who this is, but Genesis just doesn't, Genesis doesn't give us a lot of information about the serpent at this point, other than the fact that he's crafty. He's subtle. The description of the serpent becomes the most important feature of this very first account of temptation. The serpent just wants to talk, but it doesn't declare its intentions. Deceivers never tell you what the real game is until they have won and you have lost. Yes. The game the serpent was playing with Eve was that of poisoning the mind. He, he poisons her mind against God. It has to, the, the game of poisoning the mind, this is how it works. It's usually, it's, it's done by changing the way one person thinks about another person. That's poisoning the mind. It's usually done by someone who wants to disrupt a relationship. Someone who wants to separate friends or lovers or spouses can poison the mind of one person against another person. All you have to do is introduce a thought that causes doubt in one person's mind about the intentions of the other person. When this seed of doubt is sown, it begins to grow, if not immediately uprooted. It produces suspicion and distrust. Suddenly, the other person begins to seem selfish or manipulative. Maybe everything they do is just for some ulterior motive. Maybe they don't really care about you at all. Maybe they're just using you. The person who introduces this thought knows that if the strategy works, you will do yourself what he or she could never have forced you to do. The serpent's poisonous thought is introduced into Eve's mind in this way. And I'm extrapolating this from Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. The, the devil is basically saying this to Eve. God is keeping you from something that's really good. He is withholding a wonderful experience from you because he wants to keep you down. God cannot really be trusted. He is just pretending to care about you and really just wants to control you. You need to break free and do your own thing. Take what you want. Determine your own destiny and don't let yourself be ruled by this tyrant. So the thought is, the poisonous thought is sown and begins to work its way through Eve's mind. Strangely enough, after they eat the fruit, it's the, it's the serpent's words that come true and not God's word. They did not die, at least not immediately or not visibly, but they did experience a new kind of knowledge. This knowledge was the experience of shame. The first thing they realized is that they were naked. Now before it says they were naked and unashamed. All of a sudden, after disobeying God, suddenly they were naked and ashamed. 
There's some, there's some self-awareness there that wasn't there before. There's some knowledge there that wasn't, that wasn't there before. So, but what are they afraid of? I mean, they're the only two people alive on earth. Who's going to see them naked? In whose presence were they ashamed to be caught naked? They were hiding from God. That relationship had been forever changed, which is exactly what Serpent had wanted, by the way. But it seems that the man and the woman did not get what they really wanted or expected, which is often the case when we sin. There were unforeseen consequences. There's some things the devil didn't tell them. Now there was shame, there was guilt, there was fear, there was alienation between God and man. And mankind has been hiding from God ever since, trying to avoid divine scrutiny and accountability. But the interesting thing in this passage is that God will not allow them to remain hidden from his view. He will not let them go. He will not let them off the hook. God pursues them, and there is a confrontation there in Eden between God and the entire human race. God begins by asking that question that every guilty conscience fears more than anything else. What is this that you have done? Now, the response of Adam and Eve to God's question should not surprise us because it is something that any one of us could have done and probably have done in similar situations. Adam and Eve tried to blame someone else for what they had done. Eve blamed the serpent. The devil made me do it. Adam blamed Eve, his wife, and indirectly was also blaming God who had made him a wife. In other words, they did not take full responsibility for their actions. Does that sound familiar? Do you see how much like Adam and Eve we really are? Modern people have become adept at blaming everyone and everything for what is wrong in their lives and in the world. No one wants to take responsibility and say, yes, it's my fault. We should be able to see ourselves in Adam and Eve. I think that's the point of the text. We are truly, as C.S. Lewis said in the Chronicles of Narnia, we are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. The Apostle Paul argued that Adam represents the entire human race so that his sin has impacted all of us, Romans 5, 12 to 21. What Adam did is what all of us would have done if we had been there. In some sense, we were there in the loins of our father, Adam. Now, in our individualistic culture, it seems unfair to be held responsible for what someone else did, you know, original sin. But we have all done what Adam did. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. Not only have we sinned like Adam, but we also tend to try to hide it, to avoid God, to transfer the responsibility to someone else, just like Adam and Eve did. Being honest and truthful about our sin is one of the hardest things to do. Now, we're pretty good at being honest and truthful about other people's sins, but not so much about our own. It's no wonder that the whole concept of sin has all but disappeared from the modern vocabulary. We speak of ourselves in psychological terms now. We seek self-actualization and self-esteem. Modern people don't like the idea of guilt. We go to therapy. We get counseling to get rid of guilt, like we go to the doctor to get rid of an infection or to the dentist for a toothache. We want to silence that annoying conscience rather than getting to the source of the problem. But that's exactly what God is doing here. What is this that you have done? Let's talk about the source of the problem. God will not let us get away so easily. God does not choose to ignore our sin, but to confront it directly. Until we are truthful and acknowledge what we have done, there can be no reconciliation and healing. Salvation does not amount to God ignoring our sin and pretending like it's not there. In his questioning of Adam and Eve after they sinned, God is teaching us about the importance of confessing our sins and acknowledging the truth about what we have done. Until this happens, we remain in a state of alienation from God. But it's God's good purpose to bring us to a point of salvation and reconciliation. I want to talk for a moment about what I believe is is a a theological theme that, that is running through this Genesis account. And it really runs through the entire Bible. It's the, it's the idea of alienation. Mm-hmm. The account of the fall of man is really about alienation and what has caused it. Mankind is alienated from God. We're alienated from the creation. We're alienated from each other. 
It says they were cast out of Eden. That is a picture of alienation. Being cast out, being exiled is another way of showing this fundamental alienation that pervades human life. We seem to sense that there is something wrong with our lives. There's something wrong with life. Life is not what it should be. We find that life is frustrating. We never really get what we want, no matter how hard we try. And then there's this constant reminder of the sentence of death that hangs over us all of our lives. Where did that start? Where did that alienation begin? That's the question the Genesis account is answering. What Adam and Eve did is the source of this alienation that pervades human life. And the human race has continued what they started. The idea of alienation is taught throughout the Bible in various ways. I'm going to mention two examples here tonight. Alienation is taught by Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon was blessed with more earthly wisdom than any other man. And here was his observation about human life in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, the opening of the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity could mean uh, p pointless, frustrating. Another example is from the Apostle Paul. Paul, I think, is echoing this theme of vanity in Ecclesiastes, or frustration, or futility. He says in Romans 8, 20, the creation was subjected to futility. That's the same idea of, as vanity, frustration. It's like just spinning your wheels, not getting anywhere. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Romans 8, verse 20. Solomon's giving a commentary on Genesis 3 in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is really a commentary on Genesis 3. Life is vanity because of what happened in Eden. And the Apostle Paul is also commenting in Romans 8 on what happened back in the Garden of Eden. The creation has been subjected to futility or frustration because of what they did. And what we do. In other words, life is inherently flawed and imperfect because of our alienation from God. Apart from God, life is simply not what it was meant to be. And we seem to be able to sense that even without the revelation of Scripture. Frustration is just a part of life. We were not created to be independent from God. Amen. And so in a state of alienation, life simply does not make sense. We can't understand ourselves apart from God. We can't understand the meaning of life. We have gained our independence from God, and we've become like a ship that has lost its mooring and is drifting aimlessly at sea. That's the human condition. Yeah. But the world didn't start that way. When God had created everything, he said that it was good, very good. So what made everything so good in the, in the beginning? I don't think this goodness was simply a description of the natural beauty of Eden, though I'm, I'm sure it was very beautiful. The original goodness of creation was not just the outward beauty that pleases the physical sense, senses. The world still has that even in its fallen condition. The original goodness of creation, when God said, it says he's God said he saw that it was good. That, that word is a Hebrew word, shalom. You've probably heard that word. Good. It was good. Everything's very good. Creation was in a state of being that was completely wholesome. Yeah. Nothing was missing. Yeah. Everything's full. Everything's complete. You've never known life like that. That's right. yeah. At your very best times, there was something missing. There was something wrong. If you think about it. But that's not how it was in the beginning. And at the center of it all, there in the Garden of Eden, was the presence of God himself. Yeah. With God, everything is good. Yeah. It is really even impossible to understand what goodness means without God. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness is not just some philosophical abstraction. God is good. Yeah. His presence sanctifies everything else and makes everything good yeah. as it was meant to be. Take God out of the, the equation... And life loses its quality. Amen. That is not to say that human life is devoid of everything good. That would literally be hell. And that's what hell is. Hell will be where God completely withdraws anything good. We're not there yet. God is not completely withdrawn. You might say that there is still a scent of his presence in the world. But it can be very faint and fleeting. 
Now, in spite of the alienation, life is still good because God has not completely abandoned the human enterprise. Things are not as they were, but that does not mean that we should despair of life. In the darkness of sin and alienation, even in death, the goodness of God continues to shine through. God's goodness is seen in how he deals with Adam and Eve even after they had disobeyed. God is incredibly patient with them. His questioning of Adam and Eve is not done harshly or in anger or in an adversarial fashion as if God is trying to drag a confession from them. You've all probably seen those cop shows on TV where there's a good cop and a bad cop and they're trying to get this guy to confess. And That's not what God's doing here. He's not in their face trying to scare them drag this confession, or beat a confession out of them. He doesn't do that. God is not simply trying to point out their sin, gather all the evidence he needs, and then thunder forth his verdict of swift justice. That's not what's going on here in this question, what have you done? If God had simply wanted to find fault and punish Adam and Eve, he could have done that instantly. Could have done that with you, too. And me. You see, what Adam and Eve did here was not the end of God's dealing with humanity. The fact that God had any dealings with them after this at all, after their disobedience, is a revelation of God's goodness and his good purpose. Why not just dispose of the disobedient rebels and start over? Well, clearly God had something else in mind for humanity. What God wants to do and what he wants to reveal about himself would not be accomplished if God were only looking for a reason to find fault or destroy the human race. And so right there in the garden, by asking this question, what have you done? God is already beginning to reveal something of his mercy and his grace and his purpose of salvation. Now, from what we know about the fall of Satan and his angels, God had not given them any mercy. They were cast out, and that's the end of the matter, until the day of judgment when they were going to be cast into the lake of fire. There is no record of God coming to Satan or any of his fallen angels to ask them, what have you done? There is no hope held out to Satan and his fallen angels after their rebellion in heaven. But there is hope for fallen man on earth though he has also rebelled against God. And surely the angels are watching God's dealings with fallen mankind, according to 1 Peter 1, verse 12. So in God's dealing with mankind, he's not just looking for a reason to condemn and to destroy. God is not harsh. He's not hard. He's not uncaring or unkind. And it's important that we understand this about God. God is not a cruel and heartless tyrant. The closest God came to destroying the human race was the flood. So we should not think that God is soft on sin. He does have his limits. But even before the flood came, it said that as God surveyed the wickedness of that antediluvian world, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him. It grieved him to his heart. Do you know God has a heart? That God can feel. God is not a God's not like a, a giant computer in the sky who just cranks out the right answers. God has a heart. Sin grieves God in His heart. So, do we think of God in these terms, or is God something to us like a cool, calculating judge who renders an objective verdict without any personal feelings in the matter? Is that the way you think of God? Now, God is the judge of all the earth, the Bible says. And he will do what is right. But God is also a father who cares for his wayward children. Let me ask you to think about this. How would your life be different if God had no care for you and only treated you as your sins deserved? Would your life be any different than it is? Not only would we be unredeemed, but there would be things about God that would never be made known. In redemption, more about God is being made known than would have been possible if God had simply cut us off in his wrath. God's desire and purpose, you see, was to overcome sin and all of its effects and to bring reconciliation. That's why God has not completely cast off humanity. But 
God cannot bring reconciliation by ignoring our sin. That's why God confronted Adam and Eve, and that's why he asked them this question, what have you done? You don't bring reconciliation by ignoring the cause of the alienation and the enmity. It is wrong to think that forgiveness means that God is ignoring or tolerating our sin. That is denial, not forgiveness. Being in a state of denial and ignoring the truth does not heal a relationship. In fact, it only makes things worse because now there is not only the original offense, but a fundamental dishonesty. You can't have a relationship that is based on lying. There must be honesty and truthfulness for there to be a healthy relationship. Now, we know that God is not capable of lying. God does not lie. God never misrepresents himself. And he demands, above all else, that we also be honest. And that can be difficult for us. Why is it that human beings tend to lie and misrepresent themselves? Now, some of you are thinking, well, I don't do that. Well, if that's true, you don't have to listen for a couple of minutes here. I'm going to talk to the other people in the room. Why do we tend to lie and misrepresent ourselves? First, we are trying to make ourselves look better than we actually are. We are really ashamed of ourselves. And we're trying to cover ourselves, just like Adam and Eve did with the fig leaves. Amen. Secondly, we may want to try to avoid the consequences of what we have done. There, are some, there may be some very unpleasant consequences that we would rather avoid, and so we lie to try to avoid those consequences. Many times we are more concerned about the consequences of getting caught than about the nature of the wrong that we have committed. In other words, we're not really all that guilty about what we've done. We just don't want to get caught and suffer the punishment. Thirdly, we may actually be afraid of the person that we have wronged. And we lie to stay in their favor and good graces. Perhaps we don't think the person will be fair with us. And we are afraid of their punishment and their anger. That it will be too much for us to handle. Adam and Eve probably reasoned that it would be easier to hide from God to avoid the truth. Than because they did not really know what God would do. Was it not reasonable to assume that if God is the creator, then he can also destroy? We, well, we better hide. See. So if we don't have any other information about God, we may conclude that God is hard and harsh, like a man with a really bad temper, and so we don't want to provoke him to anger, and so it's better just to lie or to hide. Some people have had an earthly father like that who got angry, who lashed out consistently, and so it becomes easy to think that God is that way too. God's just like a man who loses his temper. And you don't want to make dad mad, and you certainly don't want to make God mad. Well, it's, it's true that men who are fathers may lose their tempers and lash out at their children without thinking about what is best for them, but God is not like that. Amen. Amen. I, I actually get a little irritated with, with preachers that are always comparing God to earthly fathers. That's the wrong direction. If you're, you're, if you're a father, your hope is that you're a little bit like God. And if you have a, I don't know why I just said if you have a father, of course you have a father. You hope that your father reflects something of the nature of God. God can get angry, but he is slow to anger. God's not a man. Praise God, he's not a man. I am not very slow to anger. I can get angry pretty quickly. God's not that way. And while God's wrath can be aroused, it is not God's first intention to just blow us away in his anger. God's intention is to bring salvation and healing and reconciliation. And that is why God did not leave them alone in their alienation. God pursued Adam and Eve as they hid among the trees of the garden. The first question, we could probably have a sermon on this, where are you? Is it that he didn't know? See, these questions are for them, not for him, not for God. Amen. And then what have you done, he asks. This is a loving God asking these questions. Not some angry tyrant who's going to hunt them down like, like animals to be killed. 
I say this as a loving God, but you know, I'm convinced that most people today don't really know what they're asking for when they want God to love them. They don't know what they're in for. Sometimes I think people, when they say they want God to love them, what they really mean is they want God to leave them alone. But that is not God's nature. We have to learn to trust God and believe that his intentions toward us are good and that he wants what is best for us. If we don't trust God, then we will keep hiding from him and avoiding the truth. Now, I this is my own opinion, but I don't really think Adam and Eve really knew that much about God. Now, there's no timeline in Genesis. We don't know how much time had passed from the point of their creation to the point where they sinned, but it doesn't seem to have been a long time. Though Adam and Eve were in a state of innocence when they were created, this does not imply that they really knew much about their creator. I am of the opinion, and this is just my opinion, but I am of the opinion that we know much more about God than Adam and Eve knew, even though we've never lived in a state of sinless innocence. We know more about God simply because we have more revelation. We have certain precedents we can consider because of the record of the scriptures, and we have the greatest revelation of God in Christ and the gospel. Amen. Unlike Adam and Eve, we know the rest of the story and what would happen following the fall of man in Eden. Now, there were some immediate consequences for their sin. It's not that God just let, you know, erased it all like it never happened. Not only did they realize they were naked and hide from God, that was a picture of shame and alienation, but God himself announced some more far-reaching consequences in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 24. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to summarize. These consequences that would come as a result of what they've done. Remember, the question is, what have you done? Here are some of the consequences. There would be a disruption and inequality in human relationships. Mm -hmm. Your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. There's an inequality in human relationships. Disruption because of sin. You're going to work the ground, Adam. It's going to yield thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Life's going to be frustrating. There's going to be this toilsome relationship with the natural world. And then finally, you're going to die. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The final curse of physical death. The, remember there was another tree in the garden? The tree of life, that tree was blocked off. It looks, at that point, if you, if you finish Genesis 3, future looks very bleak at that point for the human race. But if we read Genesis and the fall of man with the gospel in mind, we can see a couple of bright spots. We can see a couple of little glimmers of hope. First, there is that prophecy that God gave to the serpent with the man and the woman listening in. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. A member of the human race would come and defeat the serpent and his malevolent intentions toward humanity. God's purpose was to overcome the evil and the alienation that the serpent had wrought by his temptation. A man would overcome the serpent and crush its head. God was going to have the last word. Amen. Amen. This was not the end of the matter. Yeah. The power of sin and death would be undone. Amen. In other words, God says, what have you done? He already knew what they had done. Yeah. And God says, I'm going to undo yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, this is not the last time where we see the tree of life. The next time we read about the tree of life in the Bible is at the end of the Bible. Kind of like bookends. Yeah. Tree of life. Uh -huh. That's why John Milton, the English poet, you know, he wrote Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. That's kind of the story of the Bible. Paradise Lost in Genesis, Paradise Regained in Revelation. In Revelation 21 and 22, the tree of life is back in the world to come. The new heavens and the new earth in John's vision. In Genesis, access to the tree of life is blocked because of what the man and his wife had done. Death would rule the human race which, by the way, was a kind of mercy that we, didn't, we don't live in perpetual alienation. But God imposed the sentence of death in view of bringing life. 
In the world to come, death is no more, and there's access to the tree of life. What made the difference from Genesis to Revelation? Well, remember how the tree of life was guarded. It says there were a couple of angels there. There was a flaming sword, the Bible says, flashing back and forth, blocking the way to the tree of life. In other words, anybody who got access to the tree of life had to pass under the sword. What's the price of access to the tree of life? It's death. So what did God do? He sent his son into the world to die. To suffer the death necessary to open up the way to the tree of life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now receiving that gift of eternal life begins by answering this question. What have you done? We've got to start there. God is still asking this question. What have you done? Confessing our sins is necessary if we're going to be saved. Those who do not know they are sick or who will not admit it do not think they need a doctor. If we do not acknowledge the problem, then we will not receive the solution. Those who are not convinced of sin will not receive the Savior. Self-righteousness or legalism is an attempt by man to undo or atone for his own sin. And it can't be done. It's like sewing fig leaves together to cover our nakedness. God is not going to receive it. We cannot make up for what we have done. We can't undo it. Only God can correct the problem and we must receive his remedy. Amen. As uncomfortable as it might be to admit, I am a sinner who cannot save himself. I mean by nature. Mm-hmm. Now when I come to Christ, it's a, little, it's a new creation. It's a different matter. But I got to start here. I got to start here. I am a sinner who cannot save, I cannot save myself, and that's exactly where we must begin to receive this gift of salvation. God is greatly pleased with honesty and with truthfulness as opposed to lying and pretense, which he hates. God wants us to be honest and truthful about ourselves. The opposite of this would be to lie and to practice hypocrisy. Real change begins right there. Without honesty, there's no hope of salvation. Blaming others for your sin, by the way, is a form of dishonesty. So what does God want? When he asks this question, what have you done? What is this that you have done? What God wants us to do is to be truthful, to be honest about ourselves to speak the truth to him because he wants us to trust him that he has our best interests in mind and that he is good even if the truth is painful for us God's desire is for our salvation and transformation not just a temporary or superficial fix God always wants to get to the real issue to the heart of the matter what is this that you have done He's not asking that question so that he can condemn you. He's asking that question so that he can save you. Amen. 